Director and Managed Care Technical Assistance Center of New York State. And I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. We're going to wait one second. Uh, people are still logging on. We had a, a high number of people register for this webinar, which is fantastic because I think it's going to be great. Um, and we'll begin, we'll just begin in one minute. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is Caradina Sale with the Mixed Silver Institute, along with the Community Technical Assistance Center and Managed Care Te Technical Assistance Center of New York State. And welcome to today's webinar, Family Treatment During This COVID-19 Pandemic, presented by Dr. Suzanne Button. This is part one of our two-part offering. Part one today is building your skills as a contextual coach Interventions from Family Therapy. Part two, as a reminder, I know this is in, when you registered, you saw this, but just as a reminder, part two will happen on Tuesday, May 12th from 12 to 1, where you can join Dr. Button for a practice report and also get, uh, gain some support and feedback and share your practice experience with her. Dr. Button is a policy fellow at Shapen Hall, where she supports effective organizational implementation of transformational collaborative outcomes management, TCOM, in diverse mental health, social service, and educational systems. She has consulted, trained, and published nationally on such subjects as effective EBP, evidence-based practices implementation, and public service systems, the use of CANs in treatment planning and TCOMs, the use of technology to transform clinical practice, and the infusion of collaboration into work with marginalized children and families. Dr. Button has provided family psychotherapy and supervision in her private practice in Dutchess County, New York for more than 20 years. So thank you so much for joining today and thank you as essential workers during this pandemic for all that you're doing. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone if you haven't been with us before. And just a quick note, that you, will, you are placed on mute, so to avoid any background noise. Um, and if you come across any technical issues, please chat Plume, who's our host today, and she'll be able to assist you. Also, there are gonna be, there's one polling option and a few chat options, and you'll utilize the chat box, which is on the right-hand side. And we're gonna also ask you to submit questions during your time, or we will capture those and have a Q&A at the end. As a reminder, please visit all OMH guidance regarding COVID-19 by going to omh.ny.gov, omhweb, backslash, omhweb, backslash guidance. And I, we can chat that in the chat box, as well as CTAC. On our website, we have a number of guidance uh, and a number of other resources for you that we will also post in our chat. Without further ado, I will now pass it on to Dr. Button. And thanks again, everyone, for being here. Thanks, Kara. Welcome, everybody, to the webinar today. Um, I want to really just lead with the seconding what Kara said, which is sending a lot of deep appreciation to what all of you are doing. I still have a private practice up here in Dutchess County. I'm working with a lot of families who are stuck at home with kids of all ages who have different kinds of challenges. And I know from firsthand experience that um, it can be exhausting on the best of days and challenging, but in this time when we're all managing our own stressors and our own family needs, it's particularly challenging. And so just a quick reminder before we get into the meat of the subject matter today, to take care of yourself. Really, really take those breaks and get that rest and do the things that feed you because uh, you are essential, really, to the kids and families that you serve. Today we're going to focus not on family therapy like we would do it in our offices, but on certain select skills that you can use when you're working with families in this virtual environment. In some ways, we want to think about our work with families in a COVID-19 environment as a sort of a, um, a life preserver that we're throwing out. What are some simple contextual coaching skills that we can 
uh, transmit to the families that we serve. So we're going to talk a little bit about the possible impact for that uh, family-directed interventions has in terms of positive outcomes. We're going to do a little refresh. For many of you, it'll be a refresh um, on thinking about the family as a system and what stance you as the therapist would take in that uh, conceptualization as being a therapist to a system as opposed to a therapist to an individual. Then we're going to do a quick review of what the research base tells us are effective coaching strategies for caregivers um, for some of the more common child mental health challenges and walk through a little format uh, that you can take back with you to your practice, a sort of a map for role play and rehearsal of some of these skills with caregivers. And we're going to use some examples um, to sort of show you what it might look like. So just as, as, uh, as Kyra said, I want to encourage you to throw your questions in. There are going to be some times where I'm going to actually be asking you for your thoughts. Um, when you do answer my questions, when I ask you to chat directly to me, if you can choose the all panelists option in your chat box, that'll help me be able to see what you're saying as we're talking about it. So let's start with a quick review of the potential power of family-directed intervention. Family therapy really is well proven in the evidence base. We know that for most child mental health challenges, we get an increased impact in terms of positive outcomes for kids when we bring the family into the mix. And by bringing the family into the mix here, we're not just talking about bringing the family in for an assessment process or bringing the family in for a how's it going check-in, but actually making the family an equal partner in the delivery of intervention and changing their behaviors with the child. And we know that most of the uh, effective treatment protocols for mental health issues include at least some sort of caregiver education and some sort of coaching to shift the way caregivers respond to the behaviors that are uh, linked to the mental health challenges. We also know that across the board, across mental health diagnoses and across age groups from 0 to 21, we see outcomes for kids with mental health diagnoses improve when we actively engage caregivers in the process of treatment. And really, right, what we know is that the way we engage them has to change based on the developmental level of the child that we're serving or the young person, but that engaging them is very critical. We also want to point out that when we're looking at impact, again, it's not just checking in with the family, it's actually targeting the caregiving context, whoever those primary caregivers are, whether it's grandma and grandpa, aunt and uncle, foster parent, biological parent, adoptive parent, older sister who's doing the parenting. When we target those individuals with education and coaching, we can improve impact. It makes a lot of sense, uh, the preponderance of research that we have about the impact of family work when we think about all of the wonderful science that's growing about the developing brain. Because what we know about the developing brain, and most of you know this from your classes or your coursework or your work with younger kids in the zero to five group, right? The developing brain learns from repeat experience. And we all know we well know, because it's been 30, 40 years in the making, that infants and toddlers, that critical to infant and toddler development is that brain development piece of repeated interaction, right? Repeated interactions and experiences literally prune the brain. They shape the connections in the brain. So when a child is young, from infancy and toddlerhood up until school age, Repeated experiences with other people actually kill off connections and strengthen connections based on how many repeated experiences a child has. But what we're now learning, and this is really in the last 10 years, is that that developing brain learning from repeat experience, that process continues throughout childhood and all the way up into early adulthood. Indeed, what we're now learning is that from around age 12 to around age 21 in girls and around age 25 in boys, 
there's another second powerful reorganization of the brain that is impacted by repeated experiences. And so really it's safe for us now to say, based on the science, that children and young people learn who they are and what relationships are and how to behave and how to cope with their own challenges and the challenges in the world through repeated experience. Those experiences that are most common in the life of a young person are the most powerful in this respect. So when we think about it from this developing brain uh, perspective, it has to sort of make us a little bit humble about that single hour that we spend with a child and a little more focused on impacting those contexts that are repeatedly interacting with the child over the course of the week between our single sessions. So this just really tells us, right, family treatment is a win-win that not only are we helping the kids that we serve in terms of impacting their brain development, improving their coping, improving what they learn about the world and about relationships, but we're also supporting those critical people in the lives of the children we serve, right? And right now in the environment that you're all working in, it's even more important because as we all know, particularly those of us who are parents, we all know that the challenges right now are fairly intense. And that when kids have behavioral mental health challenges, the challenge of parenting at home full-time and homeschooling is that much more difficult. So we really wanna take on family intervention um, uh, as a win-win strategy. So that said, right, there's a lot of power behind it. There's a lot of impact that we can have using these strategies, but you and I all, we all know, all of us know, that there are real treatment challenges around engaging families, right? And the first set of challenges is well proven in the research, right? So challenges linked to social determinants of health and mental health are real barriers to family involvement. Across the board, what we know is that when families have their own socioeconomic challenges, their own health and mental health challenges, and when they have their own environmental challenges with regard to access to good health care or education or the neighborhoods or environments in which they live, we know that groups who are more challenged in these areas have a much harder time engaging with family therapy, right? That's well proven in the research. But we also know, and this is where you have a little more control in terms of how you contribute to the mix, that when caregivers are asked what keeps them from engaging with family treatment, they'll tell you en masse, so we know this from the research, that their perception of and their actual experience of being stigmatized and blamed by professionals and paraprofessionals and educators is something that makes them hang back, right? And so that when we think as therapists about approaching family work, that's where we can really change our stance and our lens to try and bring caregivers in with a lot of respect and collaboration. Another piece that we find, and I find this one very, very interesting, is that families will tell you that their expectations for therapy outcomes are very different from that of the therapist that they've met. They'll talk to you about wanting their kids to have success at school and at home and in relationships. And they'll talk to you about a perception of mismatch between a therapist's focus on emotional well-being and those outcomes. And so, it's not to say that the therapist's expectations are wrong, but it is to say that in our communication and collaboration, we, it's incumbent upon us as mental health professionals to build a bridge between the caregiver expectations and our own when we're developing goals for our psychotherapy. The other tra treatment challenge that we find is that therapists really differ radically in their skills and ability to build an alliance with caregivers, right? So again, it's not necessarily the strategies as it is the relationship building that seems to predict whether or not family work is uh, successful and engagement is successful. So let's start out, we're gonna start out with a little poll today. We wanna have you do a little self-assessment. So this is an anonymous poll. We're just gonna take a look at the group. There are about 484 people on the webinar today. So let's take a look at where people fall in terms of their own comfort level with family work. So give it a one if you feel like you're, you work with families almost all the time. 
and you're very comfortable and skilled with that work. Give it a two if you try to bring families in when you can and you have a few skills or interventions in your toolkit that you know how to use. Give it a three if you really focus your work on the individual child and you're bringing caregivers in for assessments and check-in. And give it a four if you feel like you really don't feel comfortable working with families at all. And we're going to give you just a minute to, you can see that poll question and you're I think it's in the chat box, Kara, is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. In the chat box. And it's actually A, B, C, or D. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've got one, two, three, that's and four. Okay. You have A, B, yes. C, and D. That's right. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Let's take a look and see where people fall um, along this continuum. Okay, our results should pop up in one second. Great. Oh, here we go. So can the users, can the participants all see that as well? Or should I read it, give it a little introduction? I think you should give it a little introduction. Sometimes people can see, sometimes they can't. Okay. But it looks, it looks like, like the majority of people are B. Yeah, it looks like most folks, about 25% of you fall into trying to work with families when you can and having a few tools in your tool belt that you know how to use. Just about 3% of folks focus solely on the individual use. About 13% of you said um, that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 13% of you said that you focus on the use. About 3% of you say you don't yet have any comfort level working with families at all. And 21% of the group feels very comfortable and very skilled in this area. So that's a pretty typical mix, right? There are just very few of us who nowadays in mental health haven't had much exposure or comfort level to families, but some of us do. It depends on our training and our experience and the approach that we bring to bear. But many of us have sort of a mixed set of skills. So let's then launch into a little refresher on thinking about the family as a system. Now remember, Family is defined broadly here. We're not talking about um, just that nuclear or biological family. Families come in all sorts of constellations. But when we're thinking about the system here today, we're thinking about any people who are primary caregivers or, or play a strong caregiving role for the young person that we're working with, right? So that could be a biological family, it could be a single parent, it could be grandparent or grandparents, and it could be an extended family system that shares the responsibility. It could also be in the LGBTQ community, a system of chosen parents, right? Because sometimes in LGBTQ communities, right, there are, there are folks who are not necessarily biological family who connect together and build a strong family system to care for and respond to a child. So whatever that system is, that constellation of people who are providing care to the kid, we want to think about them as a sort of a planetary system, right? So in family systems theory, what we think about is the system is a group of individuals who are strongly interconnected. And through that interconnection and repeated interaction, they develop a set of unwritten rules, typical styles of relationships between and among different members of the family, and typical predictable sets of behaviors. So the parenting uh, partnership perhaps could have typical rules between them, but then each parent will have a different style of interacting with each kid or um, each, each parenting partner. So what's interesting about family systems is that we find that no matter if it's functional or dysfunctional, all family members tend to behave in ways that protect the customary manner of that system's functioning, right? So what happens is that they develop a sort of a comfort level with their responses to one another and that if they're asked to change, family members will actually try and push back to the old way of being. So for example, if you're asking one parent to step up and take more responsibility for 
the day-to-day care of a child, (laughs) the caregiver who's more primary and who technically has more control will often criticize the behaviors of that other caregiver or interfere with that stepping up, even though that same caregiver says they need help and support and they don't want to be in charge of it all. So we want to think about when we're deciding on interventions, we want to think about each family's behavior, each family member's behavior, and how their behaviors affect and are affected by interactions with other people. So our target of intervention then becomes the actual interaction. Any intervention that improves interaction among and between family members can have the strong potential to improve family health. So let's think about this. Uh, how do we apply this to an example? Well, here's a, a seven-year-old boy named Martin, and his parents are telling us that he's a handful. And mom or dad try and set age-appropriate limits with Martin. He throws things, runs away, tries to hit his older sister. Martin's mom says she's uncomfortable with his aggressive behavior. She has her own history, and these aggressive um, episodes make her uncomfortable. So she often moves in and tries to placate Martin quickly if he's getting angry or upset. Maybe she'll give him a toy. Maybe she'll give him what he wants. Maybe she'll just try and tell him he's okay. Martin's older sister gets upset when she sees mom do this. She feels this is very unfair, and she often goes to her father during these episodes and says that he has to do something because um, it's unfair that mom's giving Martin his way. Dad, in his turn, feels very pressured and stressed during these interactions in the family and says that sometimes he does respond by screaming at Martin to get him to stop behaving badly. So now I want you to chat in here and remember to chat to the panelists so that I can see your answers. How do you think Martin's behavior impacts each family member? Let's start with mom. What's the impact of Martin's energy level and his acting out on mom, do you think? exhausting and it's triggering she feels overwhelmed by it exactly right so so whether martin is high right he reminds her of her past trauma right lots of people are using the word triggering right so we can look at that interaction right because um we see that martin may well have been just a really high energy kid from the beginning and the interaction of a high energy kid and a mom with trauma may be an interaction we want to intervene around. What about dad? What, what, what do you think the impact of dad's uh, behavior is on, uh, uh, sorry, of Martin's behavior on dad, right? What, what's he feeling or experiencing when Martin starts to escalate or act out and when Martin's sister comes to him and asks him to do something? Go ahead and chat that into the box. Yeah, so dad is affected. He feels stressed. He feels incompetent also overwhelmed and frustrated and caught in the middle between mother and sister. That's a very nice nuanced response. Feels trapped, feels like he's supposed to fix it. And someone just said it adds more stress to the home as a whole, right? So the whole family system is sort of higher up in uh, pressure and emotional pressure. Now, let's think a little bit in the other way, right? We're thinking about that interaction. So let's think, what is each family member doing that's actually supporting Martin's escalation and negative behavior? So let's start with mom. What are the behaviors that she's showing that teach Martin that he should continue to escalate? What happens when he escalates? Mom enables him, right? Negatively reinforces him, gives in to him. He gets her attention, right? It's a huge positive attention support. How about dad? What's dad doing that actually supports Martin continue to uh, escalate or act out. Yep, Dad Martin gets Dad's attention, right? It's negative attention, but he's getting it, right? Yep, screaming gets attention. Dad mirrors the anger back, right? So he's role modeling something that we're trying to not have Martin learn to do, right? Good. And then it also might, someone just said, Dad yelling might cause Mom to soothe Martin even more, right? Because if mom, we don't, we don't see that here, but that may well happen. If mom has a trauma history and more anger comes out, mom might then intervene. 
And what about the older sister? Let's think about her role in the planetary system. Let's chat in what are some of the things we think she's doing that inadvertently supports Martin's acting out. She's a player here too, right? She gives and gets attention. She feels neglected, so she kind of brings dad in. She feels ignored, right? But what are her behaviors? So how is she contributing to Martin's escalating behavior? Right, she doesn't address mom. She brings dad in. She acts as a tattletale, right? A ta she's taking on a parental role. Yeah, good, well done, right? So these are all the kinds of questions that I'm asking you that we might want to ask Martin's dad or mom to think about, or even Martin's sister, right? To think about as we start to um, have them shift their thinking from Martin as the identified patient to a systems approach to solving the problem. Well done, folks. So let's just talk before we go into some of the strategies today about your stance as a therapist in a family system. This is very, very important. And when we think back to that slide about caregiver blaming and shaming and building a caregiver alliance, there's a significant shift in your stance that has to happen for you to be able to be a coach to the context and a champion, right? So your stance is different than an individual therapist your alliance shifts from just to the child to an alliance and an allegiance to family health and functioning, right? Now, you need to trust here that when family health and functioning improves, the child you've, uh, you're serving uh, health and functioning will improve, right? But sometimes shifting your attention to that is the most important first step. And when you take that shift in attention, you, you then become a coach and a champion for each and every family member even the family member, like in this case with Martin, that's screaming at the child that you're serving, right? And you start choosing your intervention strategy based on some of those interactions and relationships that we were just observing so that you can strengthen, fortify, or shift some of the interactions. And you shift from caregiver blaming to emphasizing deep collaboration with every member of the family system and a shift away from and identifying patients. This is easier said than done, but these little tips, right, if you sort of self-evaluate, um, self, uh, these little tips can really help you shift your ability to build a strong alliance with family members. So now we're just gonna go through a very quick skim of the literature. What are some of the quick coaching strategies that you could choose for the children you're serving virtually right now? There is an evidence base on many of the challenging, uh, the mental health challenges that we work with uh, that can help support thinking about virtual family treatment. So let's start with oppositional behavior. This is the evidence base that most of us know well, right? And if we think about skills that actually will transfer to a virtual environment, here are a few that we could do. We certainly can do parent education and we can do parenting skills training particularly powerful parenting skills training for oppositional kids are teaching uh, and role-playing positive attention strategies, age-appropriate supervision and expectation strategies, reinforcement, right? We just talked about positive and negative reinforcement, and we can teach and role-play with caregivers how to do that well, and we can also teach them more nuanced aspects of reinforcement, like a rhythm reinforcement schedule, right? So things like logical consequences are a part of that, okay? So these are simple strategies that we can work with families to choose, role play, and rehearse. Now, what about other uh, diagnoses that we might be working with virtually right now? Well, the evidence based on self-injury tells us there's some pretty focal strategies that we can use virtually with families. One is, right, reducing interactional intensity Another is improving communication and discipline strategies, right? So in order to do this, we could teach parents how to do validation. We also have to role model validation. We can teach parents self-soothing skills so that they can keep their emotional intensity down. And we can teach parents problem-solving strategies for balancing oversight and control with supervision and developmentally appropriate freedom. And we can learn to do that 
right, in this virtual environment, we can help parents learn to balance those things in the home, which is sort of a new environment because the kids aren't leaving the home, right? What about for bedwetting? This is another one that has a powerful evidence base, right? When we look at impactful uh, uh, interventions for bedwetting, they really have to do with a modern understanding of what bedwetting is. We really know from the research that framing bedwetting in a psychodynamic or analytic uh, frame doesn't help uh, improve the symptoms of bedwetting. And while kids may bedwet more when they're anxious and they may regress when they're stressed, certainly this would be one of those times where we might see that, what we know is that focusing on healing bedwetting is better done by reframing the concern through a modern understanding of what causes bedwetting. And that basically is a mismatch between physiological maturity and response to body signals, right? So this kind of psychoeducation is a strategy that can reduce parent self-blame. And then we can teach those evidence-based coaching and encouragement strategies, which do transfer virtually quite well. Things like focal single strategies like retention training during the day, right? So retention training during the day would be choosing a time where kids are given a glass of water and then right, asked to hold their bladder for five minutes and then six minutes and then brought to the toilet and then given all kinds of positive reinforcement, right? Scheduled waking in the middle of the night is a powerful intervention. And it also works if kids are too young to wake up or parents are hesitant to wake their child up in the night because it's hard to get the child back to sleep. Scheduled lifting to the toilet or the potty is also good. And someone's just chatted in, having parents withhold liquids three hours prior to bed, that's a nice evidence-based intervention that you can teach, support, and strategize around. And then finally, good old positive reinforcement, right? Teaching parents to catch the child when they're using the potty, teaching the parents to give points for retention training, those sorts of things. Right, very good. Whoever chatted that in, that's a great intervention. Let's also think about anxiety and obsessive thinking and behavior because those are probably symptoms that we're seeing in exacerbation in these days with the stressors in the environment. There are lots of things we can help caregivers do about anxiety and obsessive thinking and behavior. The first is to really help caregivers understand about the temperamental roots of anxiety right? Helping caregivers understand that really takes that parent blaming away. And then teaching parents about accommodation and helping them slowly but surely reduce accommodation behaviors. So accommodation behaviors are things like uh, giving in to the anxiety, letting children completely in, uh, avoid a behavior um, because they're anxious about it, or uh, bringing your own anxiety to the mix when a child is anxious about uh, separation, right? Uh, we also can teach parents to use gentle exposure strategies, right? So exposure strategies are those in which we gradually help a child come closer and closer to an anxiety-provoking stimulus, right, and, and help them self-soothe. Parents can learn to do that with their kids at home. They also can be taught externalizing language and strategies, avoiding telling a child you are anxious and saying things to a child like, okay, your anxious monster is now taking over. Let's figure out a way to calm that anxious monster down and help her be quiet, right? These are simple strategies that we can teach caregivers to use in the home right now to help their children manage anxiety. So really our role here becomes a coach. We help the caregivers learn about the strategies. We help them learn to use the strategies. We teach the strategies and we reinforce the strategies. And the caregivers then learn to reinforce coping and self-soothing. Um, someone just chatted in a great idea. Use the virtual forum as a hierarchy of exposure for social anxiety. Chat with me, turn on the screen, now unmute. And that would be a great individual uh, intervention for a kid with social anxiety, it'd be great to think about how you could help the family uh, learn to do that. So let's go through a little uh, map that you can use 
for virtual role play and rehearsal. So let's say you choose one of those strategies, right? We're going to talk a little bit about Martin in a minute. The first thing with role play and rehearsal is always listen and support the caregiver, validate the emotional responses of the caregiver. Remember, validation is not agreement. You don't have to agree that the child is a little brat to say, it sounds like it's really stressful when he acts out in this way, right? You frame the problem as an interaction. We started out thinking about Martin together in a systems way. When does this behavior happen more or less? What helps it to be different? Who does it tend to happen with more? Who feels more competent to handle it? Those kinds of questions can start helping the family think about it as an interaction. Then we move into good old psychoeducation, right? We tell families simple changes are hard, but they can make a real difference. And we give them some education about the diagnosis that they're working with with their kid, right? And then once we've given them that education, we, this is really important, we offer all those strategies as a menu, right? In this virtual environment, there's so much going on at home that we can't measure or understand. And so we want families, caregivers, to identify a strategy that they feel they can buy into and that then feels doable, right? Next, move into role play. Start out by you as the parent and the caregiver as the kid. Model the skill. Let the caregiver make you feel the way that they feel and help show the ways that you might respond. And then debrief after that quick role play. What did they see? What would they like to try? Remember, in this process, you want to educate the parent about homeostasis. That's that place where a child will escalate behaviors to get a typical response out of a parent. And it often gets worse before it gets better when a parent or a caregiver tries to change their behavior. And so after your debrief, we want to make sure and say, did you notice how you pushed me harder during our role play? Your child's going to do that too. That was great that you knew how to do that. Next, when the parent or caregiver is ready, role play again with you as the child, with the caregiver trying out the behaviors. Remember through all of this that different family members have different levels of comfort with role play. And so you may want to be silly. You may want to do it lightly. You may want to try it with puppets. You may want to try it in the third person. What would you tell a friend of yours if they had their child was saying this? But you want to sort of gradually move into exposing the parent to increasing levels of realistic role play. Finally, debrief with the parent on their role play as the parent. Decide on next steps. Are they ready to try it with a kid? Do they want to bring their child on screen and have you coach directly? What kind of homework practice feels right and doable for them? So let's revisit Martin with this roadmap, okay? Remember Martin? We talked about him earlier in the webinar. He's seven years old and his parents say he's a handful. When his mom or dad set limits, Martin escalates. He throws things, tries to hit his sister, runs away from them. Mom's very uncomfortable with his aggression. She has her own history. She moves in to placate Martin quickly. Martin's older sister also gets upset. She sees mom do this, gets dad into the scene. She says it's unfair, and then dad feels that pressure, stress, and overwhelm that we talked about earlier and starts often screaming at Martin to get him to escalate. So we're going to look at this two ways. Let's start by what if we have dad on screen, right? Sometimes in a virtual environment, we want to actually maybe coach one parent at a time and then bring parents together and coach them as a dyad later, simply because this one-on-one -on -one skill building can be more powerful in, an, in, a, in that way. So we might say to dad, it sounds pretty tough. Dad, you want to be fair to your daughter and you want Martin to behave safely. Those are terrific goals. And I think we can um, sort of do some skill building for you that will help you meet those goals in a different way. So let me ask you some questions. What do you notice happens with Martin when you yell at Martin? What does his sister do when you yell at him? What happens with mom when you yell at him? What does she do? And what about when his sister's not around and you don't feel that pressure? What if she's in her room on a screen and she doesn't see it going on? Have you ever tried ignoring him or just are, are those moments where you're able to keep your seat and react calmly? What happens then? 
through that conversation, you start reflecting back dad's growing systems understanding of the interaction in any way that dad starts to identify, right? So you're catching dad's ideas and you're sort of amplifying them. So I'm hearing when you stay calm, Martin calms down more quickly. When Martin's sister's not part of the interaction, it's easier for you to respond. Next, we offer that menu of skills, that psychoeducation about oppositional behavior, that menu of skills, and dad chooses one that feels doable, right? Someone's just chatted in a good question here. What if you don't have privacy to work with family members separately because of overcrowded living spaces? You are going to have to do this, right? And, and I have to say, I would always advocate whether you're individually treating someone or treating them in a shared space, you want to use transparency and language that nobody else in the family would be upset with you hearing. And so you may have to adjust this roadmap to have the whole family in the screen in front of you while talking to one parent at a time, right? You never want to use language or validation that would hurt or injure another member of the family. And transparency can work in your favor. So we're going to have dad choose a skill. We're going to role, we're going to model it with dad being the kid. Then we're going to debrief what worked, what didn't. Remember to talk about homeostasis, what was harder, what will be harder with the actual moment. Dad, what did you want to pull from what you saw me do and really try in our next role play? Then move into role playing with you as the child and reminding dad he's going to use that single chosen goal, right? Um, and he's going to practice. Debrief praise and coach. Someone's talking right now in the chat about circular questions, right? Using that solution focused approach, asking dad for exceptions. When does it go well and what happens when it does go well? So let's just hone in on focal parenting skills that you can teach virtually that will really make a big impact. First, you can try and help teach strategies that parents that will change the parents' behavior, right? So we can use that role play and rehearsal math that we just went through for Martin's dad to teach and role play any of these strategies. Parents can learn to take a break. We can call this a tap out, a time out, a deep breathing moment. Parents can use stress management skills. There are all kinds of uh, focal coping stress management skills that we can teach a parent. Any kind of healthy self-soothing skill will help a parent change their own behavior. Also self-talk, right? We can get dad to say things to himself like, I'm really mad, but if I yell at Martin, I'm teaching him anger. I know I want to teach him to be a calm man, and so I'm going to teach him calmness, right? Those are strategies that we can help with um, changing parents' behavior. We can also help teach parents strategies that change their child's behavior. Simple developmentally appropriate expectations and communication of those. Planned ignoring. Positive attention, the good old catch them being good. Teaching parents how to implement a loose structure in advance or in anticipation of difficult behaviors can be helped. Teaching parents fun strategies to manage or respond to behaviors, right? Things like singing, a kid, singing to a child school age or younger when you want to do something. And also helping parents learn about modeling and think about modeling. That's a focal strategy that will help change a child's behavior. There's so many great ideas uh, in the chat box today. Um, folks are really sharing a lot of terrific ideas. And I think perhaps for our practice webinar, maybe we'll try and find a way to sort of uh, put some of those on slides too and share them back to you because there are lots of powerful practices that are being shared in the chat box. So before we go to a Q&A, I want to just run through a few more important points. In all of this role play and rehearsal, all of this coaching, collaboration is key. Lots of folks are asking questions about the individual conditions that families are facing. We have to meet families where they are, help them choose what they feel they can do, right? Focusing on a relational understanding of the problem, and what I mean by that are those systems questions we're talking about. Someone mentioned those circular questions, right? But avoiding power struggles about the why. An individual therapy stance has a lot of why in it. Why is a child acting this way? What are the feelings that are causing the child to act this way? 
A system stance takes a focus on the what. What happens when this behavior happens? What are the responses? And how can we shift those responses in a way that makes things more effective? Always offer that menu of helpful op options, right? Evidence-based strategies, but let the caregiver choose what feels doable. Make sure you educate about homeostasis and stress inoculate. It will get worse before it gets better when the child acts out more or does the symptom more. That's a sign that you're really changing your behavior. Offer code words, themes, visuals that help support the caregiver's healthy intention and reflect their own language when you do this. My favorite example of this is a mom that I worked with many years ago who was parenting an anxious tween. And she was trying to learn to keep her own anxiety out of the mix when her daughter was getting more jacked up and more anxious. And what she said to me was, sometimes I just have to pretend I have duct tape on my mouth. And so she started to say to herself, duct tape, duct tape, duct tape, when her daughter was escalating in anxiety so that she could stop talking, calm her own body down before she participated in the next stage of the conversation. So now let's think about all of that collaboration piece as we approach that same roadmap with Martin's mom. So again, we start with validation. Tell me a bit about what happens for you, what happens in your mind and body when you think Martin might act up, right? We validate. That makes a lot of sense. And the validation has some psychoeducation in it. Many parents who have struggles like this in their own childhood have strong reactions to the behaviors of their children. Lots of the folks I serve have that challenge. And and I think we can help you with it. So let's talk about some ways you can stay on your seat when you think Martin's about to act up. Here's some skills that might help, right? Model the skill with mom as the child, debrief, role play again with you as the child, remind mom of her chosen goal, reflecting back the language that she's used. Stay on my seat, duct tape on my mouth, take a breather. Debrief, praise and coach, and stress inoculate. Martin's going to increase his negative behaviors if she stops placating him. That means she's doing it right, but it also means she's going to feel a little more stressed and she's got to talk back to herself. So we're going to get to Q&A in a minute. There are lots of good questions coming into the chat box, but I want to encourage everybody um, to think about a strategy on today's slides for a situation in a, uh, that you're working with right now virtually, a child and a family, and use the role play and rehearsal map to try and work on that strategy in a virtual session. Uh, and, um, and then we're going to come back next week and we're going to hear back what did people learn, what were the challenges, what worked, what didn't, and share some wisdom on that. So uh, I think now we're going to go to Q&A for a few minutes. Uh, just a reminder, we have the practice report next week, uh, Tuesday the 12th from 12 to 1. We want to have you come back and share your experience and gather feedback. I may try and pull some of these great suggestions out so that we can feed your own collective wisdom back to you. Um, and now let's go to the Q&A. Okay. Thank you so much, Susie. This is wonderful. I, and I so appreciate and think it's fantastic all the engagement from you, um, our participants. So there are quite a few questions. I think we may have time to cover most of them. Um, somebody, there were a few times that people asked about tap outs. Can you explain what tap outs are? Yeah. So tap outs are when you have more than one member of a family system who are contributing to a negative behavior with their interactions with a child. And what often is really helpful when you're coaching caregivers is for each of them to identify the interventions that they can and can't do and the behaviors that they feel confident or more challenged to respond to. And so teaching caregiver partnerships or teams a tap out strategy is a way to secretly build compassion and empathy between and among them and good teamwork without going at any kind of a marital therapy approach. So a tap out is just this. Let's identify times of day and, and behaviors that you'll feel stronger to respond to and that I feel less strong to respond to. And let's use a code word to tap each other out when we feel like we're doing the thing we've agreed as a partnership doesn't help, right? This is a little more of a complex strategy that you wanna um, be able to work with more than one partner on at the same time. 
it's a great strength-based way to unify the parenting partnership and play up the strengths of each caregiver. Great. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Um, here's a question. What ideas do you have for parents who just want you to fix their kids and don't believe that they are part of the issue? Well, that's where, right, and that happens a lot, right? And it really is um, where I like to take that one down approach and say, wow, I would really like to be able to do that for you. Um, but what I really have learned is that the most powerful bang for our buck together is for me to help work with your child and help change your child's behaviors and coping, but I'm not going to be anywhere near as effective at that if I don't have you on my team, right? And to start with that really deep, respectful alliance building process, right? Parents come into that stance for a lot of good reasons. And we tend to see that stance negatively, but when we start to think about compassionately where that stance come from, comes from, we know it comes from feeling incompetent as a parent, feeling overwhelmed as a parent, feeling like you've tried everything and nothing is working. And also in today's environment, in any environment, with a lot of the folks we serve, there's a lot of other stress and pressure and they don't feel like they can balance at all. So when I get that response from a caregiver, that tells me something. I need a lot more validation time and I need a lot more alliance building time. But I also need to be transparent and humble. And I need to say, well, I'll try my best, but I know I won't succeed if I don't have you on my team. Fantastic. You actually just answered two questions. Somebody was asking what, um, about a response and a parent says, I've tried everything. That's fantastic. Yeah. What do you uh, do if you don't have privacy to work with family members separately due to overcrowded living spaces? Do you have any suggestions there? Yeah, I've, I've tried a few things uh, in the last, uh, in, in our COVID world, and some have worked better than others. Um, so, you know, ambient noise is a real issue when you have everybody in the same space, right? So one of the things that I think about is if it's possible, get them to use earphones, right? So that um, they're, they're at least able to hear you, right? You're, you may be managing the ambient noise. You also can think about brainstorming. It's okay for them, make sure they know it's okay for them to bring the phone or the computer or the tablet into the bathroom if they want some privacy, right? If there's absolutely no way to get privacy by going into a closet or a bathroom or putting some earphones on, then you have to strategize and use a more dyadic approach, right? So you may need to manage the family in front of you on the screen, right? And brainstorm in a more multi-individual uh, oriented way on a strategy that the whole group can team in on. Um, and, and so that is a harder ask, but since I see there's a good percentage of you who are family savvy, um, that might seem doable. Right? Remember, when you have more than one person in the room, it's important to try and be able to see them all, which can be challenging, and it's important to try and start your virtual session with a game plan on how you're going to use the screen and how you're going to use the time. Right? It becomes that much more important to use some of those skills that have been covered in previous webinars about setting up a game plan using physical signals together to talk, that sort of thing. Great, fantastic, thank you so much. Um, somebody is asking, can you provide some ideas uh, to help conceptualize families, uh, working with families when there's a high value on the parent hierarchy and obedience? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say uh, I hear a lot in that question. And the first mm -hmm. thing that comes across my mind is cultural responsiveness. Um, so I want to know more. So if you're coming back next week, what, I would love to hear more. Maybe you could, um, I don't, well, I don't know how we could do that ethically. But, but so what I think about is this, a high value on obedience is a norm for different family cultures, right? 
So I don't necessarily hear that as a problem. I hear that as a place where I need to be very, very curious. I need to hear about what the healthy striving is behind that, right? So what are the beliefs about what obedience allows, leads to, protects the child from, right? I want to hear a lot more about what that means to that parent and why that's a high value. And then I want to find a way to strategize around choosing interventions that support that value, right? I don't want to try and undermine a pervasive value in a family system, but I want to take the value and identify strategies that respect the value and strengthen the interaction. I'm trying to think of it. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, right, Mm -hmm. you might say, um, you might learn choosing your battles might actually be a strategy that helps support the value of obedience, right? Because what you can teach families is that sometimes kids of a certain age, if they're asked to obey obey constantly, they'll actually get more disobedient in Western culture or in our culture because that's sort of what they're learning, right? So um, it, it really could be that then we start thinking about, okay, obedience is important because you want to achieve this. Let's identify those areas where you're going to go to the mat, right? And if you think about that, everybody has areas where they go to the mat as parents, right? And meaning by going to the mat, we're we're not going to budge on this, right? So it's helping people get focused on what's your value, right? It's not always a value in middle class and upper middle class culture, right? Obedience is not always a value, right? So um, we want to think about, uh, we want to think about that. Someone's putting in this comment that, you know, sometimes that value of obedience can translate into something very different, which is whenever we get together with families, I feel embarrassed because my child isn't listening. So again, right, you're you're drilling into the validation piece there, which is, yeah, it's it that part is really, really challenging, right? And so that might be a place where at the very beginning, we don't want you to practice skills because you're gonna feel more stressed and more escalated. We want you to just self-soothe, right? But you get you start drilling down to what really drives parents in ineffective parenting strategies and validating that, then taking the healthy striving, which is I want my child to behave in places where people are judging them and us, right? Then that can often help shift to using a strategy successfully. Lots of great suggestions coming in here. Developmental education, mm-hmm. shifting from commanding to influencing. Lots of good wisdom mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. I think we have time for one more question, and then I just want you to remind everyone what the homework is because there were some questions about remind, um, wondering some more details around that. Okay. So one more question that came in is, would you, how, would you recommend, and I think this is pertaining to the example that you gave, uh, you know, couples therapy for mom and dad to strengthen and uh, their relationship to be a unified front for the child. Is that something you recommend? Well, um, I don't know enough about Martin and his family to know, but I can tell you that right now the last thing I would recommend in the absence of acute risk is layering another appointment onto a family that has an oppositional child, uh, an upset older child, Um, and they're quarantined with COVID-19. So maybe I would need to get to know that family more. But remember, family systems theory tells us that we don't have to go at couples therapy in a traditional sense to change the healthy functioning of the couples. There are many ways Mm -hmm. to do that particular cat. So in my mind, um, any intervention in the family is an intervention in the family and can shift relational functioning. When you get to whether or not to recommend couples therapy, that's a very individual choice that has to do with, is it really necessary? Would it really help? Or would it be just another appointment and demand on a family that's managing all kinds of other demands on top of it? And is it a priority for the family? That gets into that why, right? We say you're not able to parent together because of your relationship. That might not be how the family sees it. 
So reminder about the homework, we have one minute. Um, we're gonna go back to that slide maybe. Um, I see your move, yep, great, okay, nope, yeah. So you have the roadmap and you have a list of possible strategies that you could, or diagnoses, right? So choose a kid in a family that you're working with and try and engage one of the caregivers virtually using the roadmap this week, right? Don't choose one of your hardest cases, right? Don't choose one of the ones that you're having a hard time engaging, but take a family that you are working with and a kid could be a kid with oppositional behavior, a kid with anxious behavior, right? And choose the, and walk through that roadmap with the caregiver, right? Talk to them about validation, ask them a little bit about how they're feeling, offer them some psychoeducation and a menu of strategies, and then role play right, model the strategy uh, and uh, debrief and then have them try it. Someone just said they've started a case, so this would be difficult to do, presently building rapport with the child. If that's your only case, you may, I'm sure you could benefit from just joining in with us and, um, but actually you could build rapport with the family for half of your session this week and build rapport with the child for half of your session, right? That might be something you would choose to do. And you could use the first half of the roadmap, just validation, circular and systems questions, and psychoeducation about a menu of strategies. Just try half the roadmap with half an hour with that young person's caregiver. Is that making sense to folks? That sounds great. Thank you yeah. so much, Susie. Yeah. This is, I think this has been really helpful for so many people and given the responses and the participation, I know people have gotten a lot out of this. So participate in the homework and join us next week for part two. We look forward to seeing you. And there are many upcoming events um, with CTAC that didn't make it to these slides, but please uh, visit us at ctacny.org to see our upcoming events. And um, as always, we hope you have a wonderful day and stay safe and healthy, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye-bye.